Right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I am uh, Salim Adolfo. I am the campaign director for Empower DC. We want to welcome everybody to our virtual town hall meeting, uh, Shut Down NEP, Environmental Justice for Ivy City. We will get started in a few seconds. We just want to let uh, a few folks in that are trying to get in, and we want to take uh, full advantage of the time that we have. So. First, I want to say thank you to everybody for uh, coming out. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you decided to be here with us. So thank you so much. It's greatly appreciated. All right. Uh, give it a few more seconds. Okay, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. The time is now uh, 7.01. Can you go to the next slide, please? I'm sure there are quite a few people who have been impacted. Is the audio on? Felt the impact of Empower DC, but for those of us who have not been uh, with Empower DC and who is new to the organization, here is our vision. It uh, is DC being a state where human rights and needs are met. Systematic harm is exposed and repaired and empowered residents shape the decisions that impact our lives. And our mission is to build the power of DC residents through resident led community organizing to advance racial, economic and environmental justice. Next slide, please. Here are our organizational values. Honor, honor the history, expertise, and vision of low, moderate income, black and brown residents, and build. Build collective power that demands accountability from decision makers. Disrupt, we wanna disrupt inequitable and unjust systems and institutions. And one thing that I'm learning for sure is persist. Persist in the determined, uncompromising pursuit of justice. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about organizing, we wanna organize the community for power. And one of the issues that we hold dear to our heart is environmental justice. And that's, we wanna have equitable distribution of industrial lands and green spaces. We want to work to improve air quality and heat island effect analyzing cumulative and health impact of pollution sources and closing hazardous facilities. Next slide, please. And so today we're focusing on environmental justice issues in Ivy City. Ivy City is a historically black community in Ward 5, which was founded in 1872 and has faced longstanding environmental justice battles. The key issues here are poor air quality and respiratory illness, low tree cover, surface parking, heat island effect, lack of public green and place space, rapid gentrification and displacement, as well as incompatible industrial uses. And so with that said, we wanna get right into a film that we have, it's called People Rising, Ivy City, and it features some of uh, our great activists here in uh, Ivy City War 5, Miss Sabrina Rhodes, who will come on a little bit later. So uh, at this moment, I'm going to actually uh, share my screen so we can watch uh, a brief film on Ivy City and how this issue is impacting residents. Thank you. Let me go ahead and pull this up here. All right. Being a community organizer helps me to bond with my community. I'm not an extrovert, I'm the homebody. 
I'm a grandma, I'm a mom. So I've been so many things to my family. And now I'm still being the same thing, just in a different way. Somebody from one of the agencies said, I'm gonna start calling you G-Ma. Abbey City G-Ma, you Abbey City Grandma. I love making sure that everybody is I. And when I found out what was going on, I was like, oh, hell nah. <laughs> like, no, nah, we need to do something about this. Ivy City is one of the most unique communities in the District of Columbia. It's really like a village. And when you look at the history of Ivy City, a community founded by and for black people, you see so many repeated environmental injustices that the community was continuously having to fight against. For me, environmental racism is the systemic racism reflected in land use decisions. It gets into zoning. What is allowed on this site? In Ivy City, we, there is a chemical facility next to, attached to, somebody's residential home. So it says here, the only manufacturer of copaltite. The chemicals that they're using is dangerous to our skin, dangerous to our eyes. If it get in your nose, it's dangerous. And if it get inside your body, it affects your organs. And that should be enough for the district to say, oh, we need to get rid of this place. Methylene chloride causes damage to organs through prolonged or repeated exposure. Hopaltite, skin burns, eye burns, heart damage, kidney damage, liver damage, respiratory system damage, eye damage. Yep, this is ridiculous. When I saw this, I'm like, oh my goodness. Hey, Sean. Yeah, we just wanted to talk about you know, the things with the chemical plant and um, how have your children been doing? What's going on over there? I have lived in Abbey City for 15 years. So I started out in Abbey City Apartments and then I moved here 10 and a half years ago in this house. I was never informed that I lived next to a chemical plant when I bought my house. Since living here, I have lost my smell. My kids complain about headaches. My sons have to miss days of school when their migraines are too bad. And I have another son who has very severe asthma. And I know that his asthma flares up when he's home. And when he's not home, his asthma is in control. Each child that slept in the room that's closer to their vent on the top of their roof, they all had a learning disability. And the older ones didn't have any issues until we moved in the house. As a mother, I'm very angry because I just feel like sometimes that I make the right decision by moving around here I thought I was putting my kids in a better environment, but really I put them in harm. That's actually connected to my house. We share a wall, so I just feel like that makes me wanna fight harder for them. How do you feel? Okay. Well, we'll make sure that you know everything that we're doing, how we're doing it. We will start a campaign to shut them down. You down with that? Cool, cool. Because your kids deserve better, and they deserve to be able to play outside without the smell 
and that chemical plant being there. All right, talk to you later. can't hardly see it, it's just there. And it's small, it's, it's little. When you turn the corner, half your car done passed the building. That's just how small it is. Why is it in our residential neighborhood? Why is it in our community? They put it here because they knew that the community wasn't gonna fight against it. Just like with a lot of chemical plants in black and brown communities, they can get by with it without any fuss or fight. Back in the 30s, which was the Jim Crow era, wasn't nobody gonna say anything about this place being in there. When I was a kid, I didn't know it was a chemical plant. I've been around here since 65. You know that was a chemical plant. A lot of people still don't know it's a chemical plant. It's been grandfathered in, so they were operating before they had air permits. Mm -hmm. So we seem to think that's the only place in D.C. that don't have an air permit. We trying to figure out if there's any other places that don't have an air permit, but. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey. A lot of times I don't even sit out on the porch because it smells like something's burning mm -hmm. and you don't see smoke. Right. You don't see no smoke, right. but you just had that smell. Mm -hmm. I never knew that it was chemicals. I never knew it because there's no sign saying what they do. It should be skull and crossbones on the building, right? right? Yeah. Flammable. Yeah. Poison. <laughs> I know this is not the agency's take on it, but I just want to say this thing should not exist in a residential neighborhood. It needs to be closed, shuttered, you know, demolished, cleaned up. Like, and the fact that a home was built through a city government funded program. It is these legacy zoning laws, these legacy uh, permitting laws, these legacy things that happened well before the district had a local home rule that allows this to happen without adequate buffers. This should not exist in the residential neighborhood. No, it should not. Period. Full stop. There are laws on the books around air pollution. Unfortunately, they're often not enforced. And as we continue to mobilize residents to submit complaints, we're devising the next phases of a strategy to really force the issue. And we all going to stand together and make them get rid of this place. And a place is so small, you will miss it if you blink. They're hiding in plain sight and we can write it to expose them. What keeps me going is actually my family. And my kids, they don't deserve to have health issues for just living somewhere or going outside and playing. When we understand the law and real talk, then we use it. We use it to our advantage. We use it to save our brothers and sisters and our neighbors. We use it to take care of our community. There are laws put in place that we can actually utilize that will work for us and not against us. I'm right here, you right here. I'm right here with you. <laughs> so we're fighting this fight together because the same thing that's harming you is harming me.
right. All right. Thank you so much uh, for Namati for being a part of this and helping us create this uh, wonderful uh, documentary so that we can show what has been happening in Ivy City. I want to say to all of the folks that have just joined, you are here for our national uh, engineering products virtual town hall meeting shut down right we want to make sure that this is shut down and so i want to uh ask andrea one of our organizers to, uh, to pull up the slide so that we can show everybody what we have done so far uh to address some of these issues can you share your screen please uh so we've been working to make sure that these issues are addressed. And these are the things that we've done so far. We've contacted the EPA, DOE officials. Uh, they participated in Air Quality Awareness Week uh, in July and August of last year. The Department of Energy and Environment hired a contractor to, to, to conduct air quality testing. Uh, we've had Advisory Neighborhood Commission 5D uh, this past December pass a resolution and in February there's been public meetings to assess air monitoring results from DOE's testing. Next slide please. And in April of this year, because of the high readings of toxic chemicals that DOE found, the EPA has held follow-up meetings informing the community that the agency will conduct additional testing based upon those findings. And People Rising, Ivy City, which you just released, uh, which you just seen uh, was released and is part of the DC Environmental Justice Festival. And in July, uh, this month, we uh, co-created an op-ed uh, on uh, national engineering products uh, with use from the Summer Employment Program. And so what is it that we want? Let's go to the next slide. This is what we want. Uh, shut it down, you know, plain and simple. We don't want just the NEP to be in compliance you know, with existing air quality permit regulations. We want the national engineering products permanently closed and removed from Ivy City. And we want Ivy City residents to be able to decide how to repurpose this site for community use. Uh, thank you for sharing. And so with that said, I wanna ask one of our uh, Ivy City organizers, Ms. Sabrina Rhodes, uh, to come on off of mute and she's going to share a few words and introduce some of our uh, speakers, which one is council member uh, Zachary Parker. I want to thank you for coming on and uh, Dr. Sokovi. Uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Sabrina. Thanks. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, the only way we can do this is, is in numbers and to unify and join together to shut this place down. Um, I want to start off by introducing our first speaker, Zachary Parker, who taught seventh grade math in New Orleans <laughs> post Katrina with Teach for America. And he has spent the last eight years supporting DC school administrators at War Five schools like Dunbar High School and Mondo, Mondo Verde PCS. Zachary sees firsthand the human impact of, of a system that leaves our most vulnerable behind. He grew up watching his oldest brother struggle with a one size fit all school system that did not have the resources to support him and now sees the challenges that he faces in life because of it. Though Zachary grew up on the south side of Chicago, DC is his home. He is committed to serving this community that has been home to extended family members for decades. He graduated from Northwestern University with a Bachelor in Science and Communication Sciences and Disorders and from uh, the Columbia University Teachers College with his Master of Arts in Policy and Leadership. Zachary is a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and board member of Love to Langa, a US based nonprofit expanding educational opportunities in Langa, South Africa. Now, Zachary Parker serves as our War Five Council member. You have the floor, Council Member. Sure. Um, I'm just going to do a quick check. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And it, I was a little shocked uh, with the formal introduction, uh, but I appreciate it. 
And I would imagine it's because there are some other presenters that are going to share. Uh, but Commissioner, I want to just first acknowledge your hard work and that of Empower DC. Uh, I have been standing with you all for years now uh, and have admired your advocacy, namely around Cremel. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, we had some issues in Brentwood and the commissioner was asking me for support. And I was thinking about like, how can I bring capacity to this community? And the first group organizing uh, power that came to mind was Empower DC and you all took up that mantle. Um, and so I just uh, am glad to stand here as a partner and I'm standing in solidarity and saying that all neighbors, but especially our black and brown native residents in Ward 5 deserve to live in clean and healthy communities. Uh, Ward 5 is over-industrialized. I know some would like to deny that or suggest that it's not accurate, but it is in case the fact. And we have example after example. Uh, I'm going to get to the focus of today's conversation, uh, but even today at the council's legislative meeting, we uh, had to give more money um, to the bus terminal project in Brentwood uh, because the soil was found to be contaminated. And in an effort to bring the soil up to grade in order to make it safe, um, the council had to act. Uh, while I oppose the original decision um, to uh, give the green light for the bus terminal, and it's worth noting I wasn't on the council at that point, uh, here we are. Uh, but what that said to me was the complaints and the concerns that residents cited, that Empower DC cited, that you, Commissioner Rhodes, cited, uh, are being validated. Um, and as a result, we're having to take action. And here again in Ivy City, we have a similar thing that the concerns of residents and neighbors and you, Commissioner Rhodes, uh, are seemingly falling on deaf ears. And so uh, I, I want to start at the outset to say that my office is taking this very seriously. We are having very regular check ins with DOEE about this. In fact, our latest check in, and I'm happy to give some updates that they provided. Uh, some of this may be redundant to, to what you are going to share or have shared, uh, but the EPA at the federal level is investigating um, the site. And they are, the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, is working in concert with our local DOEE uh, site for the EPA's ongoing study. It actually kicked off today, um, and it will uh, they will be doing investigations throughout this week. Uh, that will also uh, um, go on in periods of times when the facility is not in use uh, to do a, an examination of the contamination or the, the emissions from the facility. Um, the DOEE has said that they uh, commissioned a pilot uh, a sampling, and you all, I believe, are aware of that. Uh, they took samples of, of soils and dirt, and they assessed the air quality around the facility between June 15th and June 28th, um, and that report is forthcoming. We were told that within a month or two, we would have the report. Uh, it is now July, and so by the end of July or sometime in uh, early to mid-August, we look forward to having that report. And then the other major update um, is that DOEE is waiting on the findings of their report, as well as from EPA, uh, to issue uh, two major findings. One will be whether or not uh, the NEP facility needs to have a permit, which I know you reference rightly so, that they currently don't have a permit, which is uh, just, again, a sign of how when businesses in certain communities operate, they are able to forego the law. Uh, and policies. And so that will be one major decision that DOE makes. And uh, the other will be around emissions, odor emissions from the facility. Um, I am going to drop in the chat um, DOEE's odor emission policy. I'm not sure if you all have that, Commissioner Rose. Do you already have that? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I will drop it in the chat. Uh, but they are uh, coming up with a policy and they being DOEE, uh, to determine whether this facility needs to abide by uh, a odor emission policy that would uh, force them to tamp down on the emissions coming from the site and or use other elements that would curb the scent. Um, and it's a new policy that DOE is working. All that said, um, 
there are investigations underway both at the federal level and, and at the local level. I would encourage you all to keep putting pressure on uh, our government because it is working. Uh, we are putting pressure on the council side and regularly checking in. And up until this point, DOEE has been a partner and, and seemingly taking this very seriously. I know the call tonight is to shut it down. Um, and I think if that is the vision and the course, and I think that is a righteous one, because I agree with what your video stated, that this type of chemical should not be in community and next to neighbors, uh, contaminating and causing illness and cancer and a host of other things. The way that we do that, at least from my end, is through due process. And so where we are now is due process and getting the findings from our local DOEE and the EPA. And then for that, um, hopefully there would be greater ramifications to come in the near future. Uh, last thing I would just say is, um, broadly speaking, for Ward 5 in general and for the district, uh, I've often talked about healthy communities, and I certainly see that as uh, a vision for how we can have clean air. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say through this budget cycle, we were able to secure uh, air quality monitors, uh, uh, federal grade air quality monitors. The district will receive three. And one of them has been guaranteed to be placed in Ward 5. And while I'm not uh, supposed to pick one community over another, kind of like a teacher is not supposed to pick favorite communities, uh, what I do know is that there are some communities that are facing air pollution more than others, namely Brentwood and Ivy City for the reasons we've already discussed. My team is working closely with DOEE, and we will surely work with Empower um, DC, as I know this has been top of mind for you all, and where that air quality monitor is going and how we can make sure the public has uh, available access to the data that it produces, because that's the other part. We can have the monitoring, and if the public doesn't have access to the data to hold our government accountable, that too is a problem. Uh, but our vision is around creating those healthy communities, and we are currently working on legislation uh, that will... Um, ensure that there is more parity in how we treat residents across the city, namely in Ward 5, uh, that you shouldn't have to have an Empower DC advocating on your behalf to be able to get some of this done. Unfortunately, that is where we are. And again, I'm grateful for the work of this organization. Uh, but we look forward to sharing that legislation soon when we come back from um, recess and hope to have you all as a partner. So I'm not sure if we're going to open it up for questions, dialogue, uh, but I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to stand with you all as a partner. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member, for coming on and uh, taking your time out. I know today has been a, a really uh, challenging day on the Council. We have quite a few uh, questions already in the chat. Uh, the first one that I am able to see, and I apologize if I miss your questions, I'm trying to uh, get through them. And so we'll make sure that they're there. But I see one from uh, Rachel Payton. And it reads, council member, thank you for your time tonight. Will your office be sending a letter to the mayor and or council members to ask for the closing of the factory? And so again, I just want to reiterate that I think due process here is important. Uh, that is certainly on the table, but we want to work with DOEE and receive the data from the study that they committed. Uh, again, we were told one to two months, We the clock is ticking and we're waiting to see those results. Uh, we are also waiting to see the findings of e, uh, the, the EPA. Uh, when I had a conversation with DOEE, um, and I'm generally, I'm paraphrasing, this isn't to quote them, uh, but essentially they said there were elevated emissions coming from the site, uh, but that they fail within the accept, acceptable EPA range uh, that did not give them pause so as to say that this factory needed to close down. Uh, we are looking forward to receiving those results and we'll work with Empower DC all the way. Um, but I can assure you that we are doing everything we can to build healthy communities. And so if you read through the lines, uh, we have a role <laughs> that we need to play on our end. Uh, but we agree with you that neighbors shouldn't have a polluting chemical next door to them. All right. Uh, I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask <laughs> that um, we have a rally coming up on the 26th of July, uh, and it's been organized by uh, some of the young people in Ivy City. Mm. And we would love to extend the invitation for your uh, team to participate in the rally. Is that July 26th or August 26th? I apologize, July 26th at okay, 11. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you didn't say August 26th because <laughs> uh, 
uh, we have Ward 5 Day. We haven't announced it here. So breaking news. <laughs> Breaking news, you all are getting the first dibs. We will have Ward 5 Day, which is a long-standing tradition dating back to Harry Thomas Sr. for those uh, that were around in those days. Commissioner Rose, you may remember, uh, which is will be a fun-filled day uh, bringing the community together. Uh, and it, it is a, a, um, a nod to the legacy of uh, one of our former council members. So that will be on August 26th. To your question about July 26th, I need to check my calendar, but I'm going to say yes. Okay. Um, and I'll prioritize it. And so if I have a conflict, I'll prioritize what parts I can join, uh, but count me in. All right. I saw uh, our director, uh, Ms. Parisa, uh, she had a hand raise. I did a quick hand raise. Yes. Thank you, uh, Councilman Parker, for joining us and, and for the work you've done with us over time. I just wanted to make a, a comment for all of us to consider, which is, you know, we're talking a lot about racial equity as a city. Yes, we I, I hope we recognize that racial equity requires us to revisit the laws and policies on the books and to repair the harm that's been done. And the reason why I want to raise this in the context of the campaign to shut down NEP is that the current laws cannot be the standard by which we judge whether this facility is is OK. Right. So to say that um, for DOE, for instance, to say that the the testing was done, but it was within the limits that are allowed. The limits that are allowed are unjust for this community, right? And the laws that exist are unjust for this community. And as a society, as we have uh, improved our laws, and we've said uh, you can't have a facility emitting uh, noxious odor within 100 feet of residences, or you can't have this type of industrial use next to residences, these facilities in the already impacted black and brown communities have been grandfathered in. And so those improvements never reached the most impacted communities. So that's, that's an right. extreme example of the type of racial inequity that we are experiencing. And so I would just urge all of us to yes, let's, let's attempt to work within the systems that exist, but let's also recognize that those are unjust systems. And so part of our job is to resist and to disrupt these unjust systems That's right. and force our city to come to a reckoning of the real land use changes that will be required for us to reach racial equity. Thank you. I, I, that is really powerful. And I agree that we just need an overhaul across the board on a host of things from housing to zoning to uh, air pollution and, and the list goes on. Um, one of the things that came up in my meeting with DOEE is that they have to look towards the EPA uh, because of their statutes for guidance. And there isn't really a statute for what is acceptable. And what I'm hearing you say, Parisa, is that there should be. And instead, what there is are these acceptable ranges. Um, and we know that a lot depends on who you are, where you live, what access you have to healthy foods and medical resources, and the list goes on, how that, that range of what's acceptable plays out in your life and how it impacts you. Uh, so that I, what I can say uh, is that um, the Transportation and Environment Committee is in fact looking at that. I can also say that DOEE uh, push back on the suggestion that we do revisit those levels. Um, and so you're rightly so that uh, I do think it will be a fight and I hope that you all will join us in that fight. And it's something that we're actively looking at as a committee. Uh, uh, Council member Allen chairs the Committee of Transportation and Environment for those that may be interested. Um, and, and he too joined that conversation with DOE where this came up. All right, we know we only got you for a few more minutes, so I just want to make sure that I get the questions uh, that as they appeared in order. Uh, one of the questions was for Jonelle Tony. Uh, what do the monitors pick pick up on that you? Yeah, prefer? yeah. Um, I don't know everything about these monitors, but they will be federal grade air quality monitors that would uh, measure particulates in the air, how healthy or unhealthy air quality is, and we'll be able to pick up a large radius uh, of sampling. And so we will have three as a city that will inform our local measurements, but also feed up to federal national measurements um, to be part of a broader study. Uh, in, in, in air quality monitoring and through our work on this issue, but also the engagement with DOEE, 
out of those three, we've gotten a commitment that one will definitely be located in Ward 5, uh, which is a win given our historic uh, challenge with over-industrialized communities. All right, and I'll just uh, take two more questions for you. One yes. of them being, if the residents are found to have been impacted, could this be a class action lawsuit? Absolutely. Um, as a, I'm not encouraging people to sue the government, uh, but yes, if if there has been harm and that means there would be standing, I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand that much and there would be recourse. Um, I think that is also why it's important for us to follow due process and and see what the impact is through the DOEE study, as well as anything that is found in the EPA study. Um, to make a determination of what might be the right recourse uh, for neighbors. I also saw a question earlier around the uh, proposed regulations from DOEE about the odor emissions uh, regulations and their, them being a bit dated. Uh, DOEE is waiting for the findings of its study and maybe this uh, facility will be the first uh, to have that order uh, implement it. Um, and so I think it will come down very soon. And I I get the impression that uh, DOEE is just waiting for the numbers to come in. All right. And the last question we have here is essentially, what does this look like for zoning for, you know, for Ivy City, being that you have residential and industrial right next to yeah. each other? Um, for zoning, uh, trend, uh, I think we're going to have to wait to the comp plan, which will come up uh, soon, relatively soon. Uh, in a couple of years, you'll know that when we brought up matters of zoning and industrial uh, situations as related to Brentwood, um, some of my colleagues, unfortunately, kind of dismissed the concerns of Ward 5 neighbors. And so, again, I think it's going to be important for us to follow due process, get our data and our ducks in a row and organize to make the push. Um, I appreciate my predecessor, Councilman McDuffie, uh, already speaking to this for many years, and I continue to express concern that Ward 5 is over industrialized. Uh, how we address that is by changing the zoning um, and or through legislation, and both of which we're looking at pretty closely. All right. Thank you so much, Council Member. I know you have to uh, to move on to some other things, but if there's someone from your staff that could put your contact yes. information in the chat, your constituent services person, so that we can make sure that we stay in contact with you, that would be greatly appreciated. Awesome. Um, I saw Oliver uh, from my team. He's our constituent services coordinator. Um, I believe he is still on and he will drop information in the chat. You can feel free to reach out to our office uh, anytime. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, highly encourage you to sign on to that as well, uh, where we provide regular updates. But thank you all for uh, having me join. And again, I'm standing with you all, not only in this fight, but just the fight for justice and creating a more just DC. All right. Thank you so much. Next, I'm going to bring back up our Ivy City Mama, uh, Miss Sabrina Rhodes, and she's going to introduce our other uh, speakers. Yes, um, we have a couple of more speakers for tonight. Thank you so much, Council Member. I guess he's gone. Uh, next, we have um, a community member, Chester Harrison, who has lived in Ivy City since his birth in July 1978. He has resided with his mom, Brenda Ingram, who has lived here in Ivy City. Sorry, she's lived here since 1965. And he is raising his sons here. Chester participates in neighborhood activities and advocates for his community. He just started a nonprofit, the Harrison Family Foundation, towards the end of 2022. Chester Harrison. You hey, come on in. Next. Hello, hello, everybody. How y'all doing today? Um, first of all, I would like to thank Professor DC and Powell and my ANC for all the work they've been doing in Ivy City. Like she said, I was here from um, I was born here in 1978. My mother been here since 56. She was in the short film she just showed. My mother didn't even know 65. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> My mother didn't even know that there was a chemical plant there. Better yet, when I was growing up, she never was aware that I actually played, me and my friends played out back of the community plant, which at the time had burrows, 
that had chemicals in it at one time sitting around our back um wood like that was part of our playground we didn't have a playground from been closed since my time um later on in life i started to find out about zoning find out about the harmfulness coming from the chemical plant thanks to empire dc um i started hearing a lot about people lose um smelling the scent i never could recall smelling the scent i still to this day i don't smell nothing when i walk past it when we went down there when the group of us went down there and i spoke down there i ha i don't get the scent so i'm figuring that i have been affected through all the years of me being around it um us not knowing better we um we burnt wood in the winter time to stay warm out of the burrows from the chemical plant of course today the they're not back there like they was when i was growing up in the late 80s and early 90s but um like the chemical plant has been here forever. I'm quite sure it's it's, it's bothering my kids coming up because I know it's bothering me. I have no sense of smell at all with the chemicals. Never knew what how harmful they was to me. And I'm still here and I'm ready to fight today to have this place removed. Thank y'all for my short time. Thank you, thank you, Chester. Uh, next, can y'all hear me okay? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Next, uh, Dr. Sokobi Wilson is a professor with the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health and Department of Epide Epide Epidemiology and Biostatistics, School of Public Health, University of Maryland College Park. He has over 20 years of experience and environmental health scientists in the areas of exposure, exposure science, environmental justice, environmental health disparities, community engaged research, including crowd science and community based participatory research, water quality analysis, air pollution studies, built environment, industrial animal production, climate change, community resilience and sustainability. He works primarily in partnership with community-based organizations to study and address environmental justice and health issues and translate research into action. And there are five more pages to add to his bio and, and a, well, <laughs> a small book, well-deserved, and he is on fire because he's been in the chat. So <laughs> I give it to you, Sokobi. Thank you. I like the, I'm not a big fan of Zoom, but it's really good because it allows me to talk with my fingers. So y'all see I've been, you know, just to do, that's what I normally do. I, I, I blow the chat up. So thank y'all for having me. It's been really interesting, you know, the, this journey that I've been on as a as a collaborator with uh, Empower DC. Because as the uh, previous speaker, who's my fraternity brother, was talking, and this and this is for Parisa, we started doing monitoring in Ivy City back in 2012. 2012, we had the we call it the the Right to Breathe Partnership. The Ivy City that was the name of it, the Ivy City Right to Breathe Partnership, and it included uh, folks from University of Maryland, Russ Dickerson. Uh, also, folks at George Washington, Howard University, and also uh, Shizuka. I think I think Shizuka was on the team too, from uh, Trinity, right? And so we were primarily looking at particular amount in Black carbon. So part of my this not not the question statement is, we've been doing mantra for a long time, and the data wasn't used. I know it's a different DOE, and it, I mean I would say we did that rigorously, but they didn't take the concerns seriously. Okay. They didn't take the concern seriously then. So I just want to say that because, I mean, you're advocating for more monitoring. I put a lot of stuff in the chat, but I think, you know, when you look at this specific facility, those monitors, as I said in the chat, the, the new monitors, they're going to be really helpful, but then fit for purpose. They may not capture what needs to be the missions that are coming from the operation. So I want you know, as y'all advocate, you want to make sure that DOEE, is getting specific monitors that measures a specific uh, chemicals concern. Because particular matter is not a great, I don't think it's gonna be a great proxy for methylene chloride or formaldehyde. You need to have a, a, a VL, I mean, formaldehyde is a, is a VOC. So you need to have a, a VOC canister approach. EPA has a, has a method for that. 
So it's a separate uh, monitor methodology you need to use for the VOCs. And again, so you, you can't, PM is gonna probably really a crude proxy, a very crude proxy. So you're gonna to get to what we like to call exposure misclassification. So really push to have build out a super site in Ivy City. And I use the term super site, has multiple sensors that can capture a wide range of chemical concern from that operation, but other sources, your mobile sources and other stationary sources. Just wanted to say that as y'all advocate, but you know, this, this particular facility, and it's kind of honing in on that, and I put this in the chat, um, it's been operating grandfathered. I think that's a problem. Y'all haven't gotten due process, just to use my uh, frat brother's language. And this is a violation to me of the Civil Rights Act, Disparate Impacts Clause, Civil Rights Act. Y'all should go ahead, if you haven't already done so, I will submit a civil rights complaint tomorrow. You, I mean, you you have the stories, you have enough data, you don't have to wait, okay? I would do that. I would also say, what's going on with the REACH Act? Isn't the REACH Act be, should be doing more? What's up with the, 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 the mayor's sustainability plan? This ain't sustainability, having this facility, right? And think about zoning. Zoning, is, zoning has been weaponized against folks, black folks, folks of color in these certain wards in DC. Zoning has been weaponized. So as you strategize, you should be pushing to change the comprehensive plan. You should be pushing to change the uh, master plan. You should be making sure there's a community benefits agreement uh, language put into the uh, into the uh, comprehensive plan. So any communities that have been experiencing environmental justice, you can get reparations, build a reparations component into the comprehensive plan to make up for the decades of, of poisoning that y'all have experienced. Because the problem is, the monitoring is just a snapshot of what's happening today. What about the 70, 80 years, 90 years? What year is it, 1930, Sabrina? What, what year was it? No, the 90 years of exposure. 1930. Where's the reparations, right? So that's what we talk about, cumulative impacts. The cumulative impacts of that operation on the health, the quality of life, or residents, how you gonna get those years back? How you gonna get those uh, hospitalizations back? How are you gonna get your family members back, right? So the reparations restoration part, that's where the cumulative impact. So I know y'all are talking about it, but y'all need to be pushing for a cumulative impacts ordinance. Okay. And it needs to have a pollution prevention and a polluter pays component, not just this facility. So preventing future pollution and paying for past pollution. That's gonna really be really important. So let me just repeat what I've said. So your FRMs. That's that's a good start. You need other sensors to get to pollutants concerned for this, this operation. You need to make sure that you're you have a that y'all drive the air quality monitoring plan. And I didn't say this yet, the air quality monitoring plan for your community, for both obviously and Brentwood. It should be built into the zoning codes, the master plan that y'all control. The ANC informs, is informed by the impact community, that master plan and air quality monitoring. Uh, AB 617 or AB 619 in California provides a framework for community-based air quality monitoring and, and, and have a requirement that the data is used, not just sits on a, a, and gets dusty like what happened with us, Parisa, with the data that we collected a decade ago. FRMs, that's a Federal Reference Method Monitor. That was what the uh, council member, that's the, that's the acronym he used before. So those are the regulatory grade monitors that he said there will be three for DC. So DC, as I said in the chat, is under, uh, as it relates to its monitoring infrastructure, the adding the three is good, but having an FRM gives you more of a general uh, sort of understanding what's happening. It doesn't give you site specific, neighborhood specific, household specific, what's going on in your neighborhood. So it's, it's actually not fit for purpose. You wanna know what's going on the fence line uh, for the residents that live by the operation, that FRM is not gonna capture that data. That FRM is not going to give you the information that you want to get. So you need to supplement that with some site-specific monitoring and some hyper-local air quality monitoring so you actually get uh, spatially resolved, spatially relevant, locally relevant data. So it's, it's a great step, but you need to have local monitoring. And then again, going back to the larger plan, making sure that what y'all are doing is baked into the comprehensive plan, baked into the master plan, baked into the zoning plan, making sure you get cumulative impacts ordinance or community impacts language into the conference plan, the master plan, okay? So that's that, I'll, I'll, I just wanna repeat those things. Additionally, when you think about this operation, I mean, 
I think it's important that the EPA and DOE are working together, but but you need to have a multi-pronged approach. I wouldn't wait on, on them to get done with their study. It's important to have that. But um, you know, would this facility still be operating? Which ward? Is it ward one? Which ward is like more uh wealthy white residents? I don't know DC as well, I should know. You know the wards I'm talking about. You know, ward you said three? Was that three, Parisa? Ward three. So why is it? So this is this is a NIMBY. It's, and you got NIMBY. NIMBYism protects white wealthy folks, but PIPIism doesn't protect black folk. Uh, folks of color. PIPIism is putting blacks backyards, or in this case, Kibby keeping blacks backyards because they put it in there and they kept it in there. So you had PIBBY and Kibby. Okay, got to stop the PIBBY and Kibby. Y'all can use those in our neighborhoods. Okay, so that needs to be part of your campaign. So I think the campaign that you should shut it down. But also, that should be your phase one, as you're already doing. You got to deal with the other sources, too. And that's another way to leverage the cumulative impacts framework. You The, the impacts, not just in your health, but your quality of life and your economic opportunities and your ability to have good well-being. You want to say, hey, and this is also important for DOE as they figure out where to site those monitors and where to bring in new monitors. What what what's their approach to figuring out what is going to place the monitors? So I was I know DOEE has their own mapping tool, uh, internal mapping tool. It's not publicly available. That's a problem, y'all. Y'all should be advocating for the DC to have their own DC EJ screen that's publicly available, so you can do your own mapping and see what's happening. Now, as a substitute, you can use US EPA EJ screen, but you should have a DC specific tool. Now, I know Parisa, we had talked about. Maybe helping y'all build a tool some years ago. I had a grand idea, but I had a I didn't have the staff for the infrastructure. Now you know, of course, we had the staff and infrastructure, so we can help y'all build a DC DC specific tool. Uh, for example, we worked on and, and, and Sabrina, cut me off. I know you want to pass the mic to other folks, but you would hook me like uh, uh, <laughs> Apollo. You know, if it's time, you know, hook. Give me the hook. I'll but, be um, up in there. I'll three more minutes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Three minutes. three minutes. Thank you, thank you. So one thing you could do. We we built out recently, and y'all can leverage this. We built a Mid Atlantic. So we had a larger project with the National Academy of Medicine to help them develop a national a mapping interface to map climate risks for the whole country. We started to build a Mid Atlantic tool from that interface. So we so that that Mid Atlantic tool will be available for use by end of August. So it will have a DC component to it. So we will have something you can that you can use that's more DC centric, but we could also build a separate DC centric tool that's informed more by the community, by the ANCs, to make sure the indicators and the layers are representative of your daily experiences. Okay, so we can do that as as a, as a as a part of our collaboration. So I have the infrastructure to do that. So I just, I just want to share that because that that type of tool will help identify, prioritize, and market target communities with the most need, right? And you already know that based on your, your experience as contextual experts, but then maybe when it comes to uh, more investments of federal resources or better implementation of the mayor's sustainability plan, because you know, all the gentrification, let me stop talking, let me leave it alone. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna just leave, leave that alone. Y'all working on that. Y'all know that better than me, right? I'm gonna just leave that alone. But the sustainability plan, just to piggyback on a little bit more, how do we bake more justice and equity in a sustainability plan and have better metrics attract impact and accountability? That's something to do. And also even with the zoning board decisions, because one of the things that, that, I, that I heard y'all say, this facility has been acting without a permit. The operator of, the, of, the, of this facility, do they have permits in other communities? That's something I'm not sure y'all found it out, but do they have permits in other communities? So they do, then why are they allow to get away with not having a permit in your community. So, Parisa, you have a response to that? Yes, Parisa. Yes. Yeah. So, well, first of all, I just want to thank you, Dr. Shakobi Wilson, for being the incredible leader that you are and continue to be. And, and for those who don't know um, Dr. Shakobi Wilson, that he, he has helped to form a Mid-Atlantic alliance of many groups like Empower DC. And, and we're grateful to be part of that. And his team member, Pamela, also on the on the call tonight. Um, and there's a lot of uh, emphasis on environmental justice right now because of the work of leaders like Shakobi and Pamela and others who've been working and doing this for decades. We're at a moment now where the Biden administration has made environmental justice a priority, and there's a lot of money coming down through the EPA to community initiatives. 
we're grateful to be in such great company and to use this opportunity to really uplift Ivy City and to mm -hmm. finally solve and address these ongoing uh, injustices. I guess, Shikobi, and you know, there's a lot of technical uh, stuff that is being offered and there's, there's yeah. a lot of this stuff will take a lot of, you know, significant time and expertise to put together. I want to talk about what we can accomplish simply yes. by unifying around a demand, making our demand visible and, yep. and calling for action. And, and I say that again, because I'm, I'm concerned that we, we come into these patterns where yes, we want to have all the data and we yeah. want to have all the analysis, but we cannot uh, sustain a system where impacted communities are forced to become experts on every, you know, chemical I agree. On every, of pollution I agree. And, and develop, you know, scientific methods to prove that they've been harmed when we know that they've been harmed. So I just wanted to, to lend yeah. that and, and ask if you agree with me that there is a moment in time right now that if we yeah. raise our voices and in, increase the visibility of this issue and make the demand that we will also make progress, even if we don't have all of the mapping tools and all of the oh, other yeah. analysis. Yeah, so let me, yeah, so I'm, I'm a, I'm, part of me is a technocrat, so y'all, y'all know y'all get that, but I had the same conversation earlier, and, and, and we're, I was trying to be careful with the New Jersey EJ Alliance, they want to do some monitoring, and I said, well, it's, it's messed up that you've been poisoned, and you also got to do monitoring, Parisa, that's what I basically said, so I got to do your, you poisoning me, and I got to do your job for you too, who wants to do that? So you're, that's why I made the comment. Y'all can su submit a civil rights complaint as an action right now. You got to wait for data. You are. We have enough data. Paris, we have data from 2012. We we right. did no one. They didn't act on that data. So data is not going to lead to the action. What's going to lead to action is advocacy, organizing, right? Then telling your narrative, telling your story, making sure the people who are impacted are at the front. We got it. So. Act, you know, representative justice. So the folks who are impacted are at the front telling their stories. That's what you should prioritize. I'm happy to help provide insight, like on the monitoring, all that, and keep people, you know, keep them in check. But that should not be your priority. Your priority should be advocacy and organizing. You have enough data, right? You have your, your partnership with your neighborhoods, you know, Brentwood and Ivy City and other neighborhoods coming together and, and, and basically keeping the pressure on DOEE keeping the pressure on the council, keeping the pressure on the mayor's office, keeping the pressure on EPA headquarters, on EPA region three, that's what you should prioritize. So, so thank you for giving me the shift that like getting my technocrat mode, but getting to my empowerment science and liberation science mode, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. That's what you should prioritize. Thank you. And I and I uh, we want to put pressure on all of those um, targets that you just mentioned, and we want to create change, not just for Ivy City, but systemic change that reaches all communities have, who have been harmed. But we're also going to put pressure on this company and the owners yep. of yep. this company, which are based very close by and live in Chevy Chase in a nice home and a nice neighborhood and um, Na as neighborhood protests go 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 protest chat, right from the, the house uh, that, that, as can, I that mentioned be part in the chat, well. you know have benefited from the generational wealth and literally because we've you know seen the history where it's been passed down from one generation to the next the ownership of this company while they have harmed the community in this way so i i think it's a time for us to talk about some of those next steps um and how we're going to move this to action thank you so much dr wilson we really appreciate now, uh, you uh, you're welcome. One more comment, Parisa. I mean, what you just said, it's a form uh, of, of, of pollution politics that we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, colonialism, basically, that you can pass it down family and family. You, you're extracting from us. You're killing us. You're poisoning us. And you're making money off of our pain and being poisoned. Yeah, that, that needs to be. So newspaper articles, media attention. I make I can might work protesting in front of their their in front of their homes, uh, doing the same thing. You know, putting you know doing uh, man, I say old school, but making sure you include protests, rallies, campaigns that really getting that media attention and putting the pressure on those on those people who supposedly have the power to change you know make this change happen. I think that's what you should prioritize. All right, so thank you. Stop. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you so much, <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and you set us up for our transition uh, to this next piece. Uh, 
Andrea, can you bring it up? So here are our next steps. Uh, I just placed in the chat the link to our sign-on letter. We got 35 people that have signed on. I'm going to ask if we can try to get this up to 100 by the end of the day. That means you sign on, text it to a few of your friends, get them to sign on, and let's build that advocacy that uh, Dr. Wilson was just speaking about, right? Get that out there, share that as much as you can. We're gonna put together uh, a campaign and we need your support to do that. Uh, the next thing is that we have the rally on the 26th. Uh, if you got this email, you saw the sign up date, uh, you saw the uh, save the date and then you can sign up for it as well. It'll be at 11 a.m. right outside of the factory. This has been organized not just by us, but some of the uh, young folks in uh, Ivy City as well. And you can continue to follow us on social media. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? And ultimately, this is about building power. You can build personal empowerment. That's having the confidence in one's ability to create change. We can build political power, the ability to influence decisions and deliver consequences. But ultimate power is about control and ownership. Uh, you can stop sharing. And so what does that look like for us? It goes right back to what we begin with and what do we want? We wanna shut this down and we want residents from Ivy City to have the ultimate power in their community and have ownership and self-determination over what goes on in their communities. I wanna say thank you to uh, all of the organizers uh, from this, all of the folks from uh, Namity, if they wanna share a few words, you can uh, before we close out, but we want to thank uh, Andrea, who's been behind the scenes, working all of the uh, tech stuff for us. Uh, Teresi, who handled a lot of the flyers and social media for making uh, you know all of this stuff happen. And we got a lot of good young people. You may have seen some of their stuff on social media today uh, with some of the uh, some youth employment program workers. But we want to say uh, you know thank you to the Ivy City residents. We know who've been part of this fight from day one and you know we're just working alongside of them and helping to be the voice for them uh if you want to say a few words jay you can yeah thank you salim and thank you to everyone who has shared with everyone tonight and thank you everyone for showing up um to those anyone who doesn't know me my name is jay uh, i'm with namati's u.s environmental justice program we're honored to be working with the Ivy City residents and Empower DC and Dr. Wilson and many other folks on this call uh, across DC and across the Mid-Atlantic to be addressing environmental toxic threats, environmental justice, economic justice, racial justice, and all the other justices that there is not enough of uh, and that have historically been so hard to achieve and so hard to win. As Salim and others have said, I'm gonna be really, really brief because everybody said everything that I was gonna say anyway. Um, as Salim has said, uh, Ivy City should decide what happens in Ivy City. Um, Ivy City residents should decide what air they breathe and what is in the soil under their feet and what happens at the site of this chemical plant. And that starts with what doesn't happen at the site of this chemical plant, and that's the ongoing operations of national engineering products. So again, in the Zoom chat is the link to sign up to the July 26th rally, uh, 11 a.m. Um, we wanna show how many people are sick and tired of being sick and tired, uh, and how many people are in solidarity with Ivy City residents and with clean air and clean water and clean soil for everybody in the city and everybody, period. So please join us uh, at the rally and stay tuned for additional uh, updates afterwards. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're going to get ready to close out. What I would ask if we can just get uh, the folks from Novelty to place your social media handles in the chat so people can follow you across uh, those different platforms as well. And you can follow us at Empower DC uh, across social media. And I'm going to put that in there for everybody. And let's get out here and get to work. We got to build this movement and get this place shut down. Uh, so on that note, thank you, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we will see you all on the 26th, 11 a.m. Have a good night. See y'all. everybody. Bye-bye.